Hello, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so first up, we have um, just want to say that we have three really awesome captains here with us today that are really excited um, to speak to you. Um, first up, we have Ajit. And he's going to be talking about best ways to use Docker 112 service discovery. And Ajit is currently working as technical lead engineer in the Enterprise Solutions Group at Dell India Research and Development and has solid understanding of a diverse range of IT infrastructure, system management, system integration, engineering, and quality assurance. Ajit has a great passion for upcoming trends and technologies, and he loves contributing towards open source space through writing and blogging at www.collabnax.com. So Ajit, um, I'll pass it over to you. Yes, thanks. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, to all for joining. Today, I am Ajit Wright, speaking from India. And uh, I have with me uh, two Docker captains, Victor and Brett, in another part of the world. And we are going to talk about uh, uh, Docker 1.12, and especially the, trick, the tips and tricks and few functionalities. Uh, let's get started with this. Uh, a little about myself. Uh, I am currently working in Dell as a project lead engineer in global solution engineering, and I have, uh, uh, which is under the Enterprise Solution Group. Uh, so it has been five years since I've been working in Dell. Before that, I was with VMware and pretty some time with Logica. I am also uh, leading a Solaris effort, uh, and uh, and probably. Uh, I have been a part of Docker Captains program where we do a kind of a contribution towards the Docker community, and I have been contributing towards blog, blogs, meetups, and seminars. And these are the listed few of the technology which I have worked on. So let's talk about today agenda. Today I'm I'm going to talk about what's new in Docker Swarm mode. It's a kind of a quick recap, and then I will move through the evolution of service discovery uh, right from Docker 1.9 to 1.12. And then I am going to touch upon uh, definition of services, how service discovery works. And I have a small recorded demo which I'm going to play so that I can cover most of them. And finally, a key takeaway is uh, if you are looking at the service discovery point, or you have been already been using in the production environment, what are the key takeaways for that? And I have around 15 to 20 minutes, which I'm going to talk. And let's see if I can cover all these topics. So if you look at uh, Docker 1.12, there have been a lot of new functionalities which have been added. So in the last uh, Docker, uh, uh, DockerCon, uh, Docker 1.12 was announced. Uh, it brought a lot of exciting features. One of the features is Swarm mode. And what does it mean is if you install Docker 1.12, uh, you have a Swarm rightly integrated into the engine. You don't have to depend upon a separate repository called Swarm, which we used to do prior to Docker 1.12. And thanks to Swarm Kit, Swarm Kit was a kind of a, a technical foundation for uh, Swarm mode. And it is a separate uh, GitHub repository. Uh, and we have uh, basically all the orchestration engine has been built on top of uh, the Swarm Kit. Uh, three new APIs has been, uh, has, has been announced uh, during the DockerCon with Docker 1.12, Docker Swarm, Node, and Service. And I am basically going to, uh, I, I will be uh, covering the service discovery part, whereas Victor, and Fred, uh, Brett will be uh, talking about the load balancing and other uh, uh, tips and tricks related to the command uh, CLI, Docker CLI. So let's get started with the uh, service discovery. Uh, service discovery is itself is not a new concept altogether. Uh, it has been there since uh, uh, Docker 1.9, where we have, uh, uh, where we used to have an ETC host, where we do a kind of a, 
a listing of a manual listing of all the cluster nodes and services. But the problem was the corrupted ETC host sometimes do that and lacking of load balancing features. Uh, uh, then uh, in Docker 1.110, uh, uh, there was a concept of embedded DNS, uh, which was which which about a, a kind of DNS which is rightly integrated into a Docker engine. So uh, and uh, but still in Docker 1.110, we had a few problems. Why? Because of uh, DNS. And we 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 all you know we all who have been using in the production environment we were dependent on external like console and zookeeper. So in Docker 1.1.12, uh, I think Docker team has done a really great job of uh, integrating uh, a kind of uh, uh, embedded DNS uh, into the Docker engine. Plus, you don't depend on external uh, service discovery backend. So if you have been using uh, if you have been using uh, Docker version prior to 1.12, you are depending upon the external service discovery. But in Docker 1.12, all the orchestration features and uh, the load balancing, everything is handled in build. So once you install Docker 1.12, you have all those functionalities. But the important uh, important feature which has been introduced is a kind of a three new APIs has been introduced: Docker Service, Node, and Swarm. So we have a Docker Service command for the first time as a top-level constraint. So it has become a first-class citizen, and we can do a discovery by unqualified names, uh, and that makes an application uh, totally uh, portable. And that becomes uh, and that provides a kind of a high availability. And with Docker 1.12, we have an ability to discover both services and tasks. I have a small demo where I can show you how it is. We can do a service discovery. So let's start with first with the service. Uh, a service. Uh, if you have run, if you have basically uh, tried to run a container. Uh, you run Docker run hyphen D and uh, a, a kind of any uh, Docker image name, and that basically builds your container or you start the container in a single machine. But when we talk about a containers on the multi-host networking, if you want to deploy it, so we can do it by Docker service create, and we can have a number of tasks. So what this command does is it it will basically create a replicas of a task. Now, service is definition of task. Task is nothing but a kind of a workload. So as of now, we have a container workload, uh, workload. But in future, we will we will have uh, unikernels and VMs in future, which will be uh, which will be coming soon. So service is a kind of a first class citizen here, and uh, service basically handles a, a it basically creates a number of tasks which are nothing but in containers. Uh, which gets uh, distributed across uh, the cluster. The two types of services, global services and replicated services. Uh, global services means that if you have, you want to have a containers which has to be run on all uh, in all the nodes in the cluster, uh, you can just pass a, mo a hyphen hyphen mode is equal to global and that is going to create a service, uh, create a containers out of that. Whereas the replicated services is how many copies of uh, containers uh, you want to run on uh, across the cluster. So, so this is something which is very uh, very new and it has been introduced in Docker 1.1.2. And I am going to spend a couple of uh, um, uh, couple of minutes on this. So, just uh, let let us understand service discovery in in a more clear way. So, suppose you have a cluster. Uh, suppose you have a two when you start any. Uh, suppose you are doing a kind of a web hosting uh, environment. You are setting up the web hosting environment. We start with setting up the nodes, node one and node two, and then you build up the more nodes in the swarm cluster. Then you bring about a kind of a front end. Your front front end is talking to, uh, to talking to the APIs, and and at the end of the day. Each and every containers which are running inside your uh, cluster is talking to each other, and this is how it looks like. So, uh, so before 1.1.2, we used to do a kind of embedded DNS, which is kind to do a discovery, and 
but that has been a kind of a, a, a complicated process but but with 1.12 we we have seen like it has become very easy uh, so at the end of the day if i have to define a service discovery it just helps the services find and talk to each other say service a is a kind of a front end and service b is a back end what you are doing is you are trying to find out the address where uh, uh, service a has to know the address where the service b sits and uh, there is a there, there is a notion of uh, network uh, it is uh, services are very much network scope so which i am going to talk about but during the course of time when you scale the services your service a has to know uh, has to reach out to those uh, uh, those particular services which has been uh, the copies of services which has been uh, spread across the cluster and and this is this is where you know uh, your embedded dns and your uh, the load balancing uh, features come into the picture so let us see how internally the docker handles that so uh, so in this slide uh, the first thing is if if you have any of the container which is sitting in the uh, cluster and if you go into the container and try to do a kind of a ping or take ns lookup and try to do a service discovery for a particular service say wordpress app is my front end service so dns request is generated by the containers and uh, it looks the first thing is uh, what the docker team has done is is basically there is a listener uh, at each at and all the uh, containers so if you see at etcresolve.com you will see like there is a kind of a very interesting uh, loopback address 127.0.11 and and let me highlight this okay so uh, when you do cat etc resolve.conf it will basically search for the name server and this and uh, this is a listener and the next step is uh, socket is created inside the each of the container namespace and then it is sent to the random udp and tcp port inside the docker daemon and this you can see if you try to go and open up the nat table inside the network namespace the container namespace you will you will see the entry and that is where you know the destination port is uh, basically it is sent to the uh, random udp tcp port and then the loopback address is trapped and then dns server comes to know like okay from which network this particular request is coming from so this this is how uh, embedded dns uh, try to resolve on qualified names the other side if if i want to demonstrate the service discovery under the swarm mode so this is how it looks like where you create a new overlay network and uh, suppose you create an overlay network uh, docker network create and the driver as an overlay and this is a kind of a, a, a kind of a network you created now you have a you have a flexibility here to uh, enter the subnet uh, to uh, to pass on the subnet and the opt encrypted is the way where you in uh, you do a kind of a, a vxlan encryption uh, which you implement uh, on this network so when you create a service so this is the command where you create a service where you can uh, there are two ways to create it uh, as of now it supports uh, the one is dns rr Again, SRR has been there for a while, but the new kind of a service mode which has been created is a VIP uh, virtual uh, IP address, and this is a kind of a private non-routable uh, IP, which basically uses a IPVS which has been there for kernel for a long time. So once you create a service, you can you can supply a kind of okay, I need a five copies of this particular service, and and at the end of the day you you are using the network called collabnet and you are publishing on the cluster port so the first 80 is basically the cluster port and the second is the container port and you are basically creating a service saying like i need a five replicas of this which has to be published on 80 port of the cluster node so when you do this the virtual ip address is assigned to each service which you can uh, which which is the json format you can basically filter it out in such a way and 10 004 is uh, 10004 is the one uh, is is a uh, web address and then uh, 
maps to your DNS alias, and and this and since we are using the uh, throughout the worker nodes, we are using a GOSI protocol, and this is only the medium where the information is shared across the cluster. And at the end of the day, you have a you you are able to uh, resolve uh, the uh, you are able to resolve and uh, the service one service a particular service is able to discover the other service. So this is this is a kind of uh, so, so I have uh, what I have done is I have put it in the demo, which we can go through so that you have a clear idea of what what it is going on. So let, let me start this. So I have uh, I have a kind of a five node cluster uh, which I have been, which I have set up in Google Cloud Engine, and I am going to demo uh, a WordPress website. Uh, basically, you can see uh, you can find uh, all this uh, screenshot in my uh, in my personal blog collabnix.com uh, if you have ever visited. So I am running Docker 1.1.12 uh, inside this. Uh, uh, in uh, in the Docker engine. So as of now, if you see the network by default, uh, we have a bridge, uh, Docker uh, uh, gateway bridge, which connects you to the outside world, and we have an ingress for routing mesh. I think Victor is going to talk about this. So I created a new network called CollabNet. This is a user-defined network where I am going to host my application. So if you see net, uh, Docker network LS, you will see that uh, I have, uh, you can see the collab net and the scope is an important here. It's a swarm scope. Why? Because uh, I've been using a swarm mode to initialize it. So I already have a swarm node cluster which I have set up in this. Uh, so as of now, there is no service which is running and I am going to create a service uh, the backend service first, so you can just run sudo docker service create and, and specify the name. So I will specify the name as uh, WordPress DB1. I'm going to use the user defined network which I have specified earlier, which is CollabNet. Now this is very important uh, point here. Uh, one point which to remember is uh, I have declared an environmental variable as WordPress underscore uh, environmental variable uh, where I am going to specify a, a, the, just just the service name or the container name. So which I am going to specify now. So you can pass a lot of environmental variable here. The first is MySQL root password. I'm just specifying the name of uh, database as uh, WordPress. Uh, I have created a, a replicas too. So there will be a two copies of uh, the WordPress uh, DB. Which, which is going to be created, and at last I'm specifying the image name. So if you see that, just one command and your uh, two replicas of MySQL have been running here. Replicas are just copies of uh, MySQL DB which will be running, and you can use this command sudo docker service uh, ps command uh, to display the number of copies, and you can see which node it is running on. So as of now, I can see there is one copy of uh, WordPress DB1 which is running on master one. And there is uh, one important thing here is Docker PS always list out uh, the containers which is running on the local machine. As of now, we don't have any utility where we can just know uh, all the containers which is running on all the nodes. So we can't have a detailed information out of that but that might come in future. So I can go and inspect this particular service by docker service inspect command and I will, you, you can see a virtual IP has been assigned to this 10.0.0.2 which I was talking about.
the other way around to get uh, this information is passing on the json format and it looks like someone like this i think i need a space in here so you can display directly uh, the particular vip address which is assigned so this vip is virtual ip address is for particular service so if i have a wordpress app service so wordpress app is going to get a separate vip whereas whenever i create any new service uh, a new vip is assigned to uh, the particular service now i am going to uh, create a service the uh, the front end service and if you see the environmental variable which i have declared here i have not used any kind of a link which we used to use in old uh, version of docker i just pass environmental db host as a wordpress db1 that basically reflects the service discovery aspect where i am uh, i am trying to one of the service is trying to reach out the other service through unqualified name and this is scoped within a network so i have a replica seven copies of uh this particular wordpress front end uh, service which has to be created and, and i have specified as the service name as wordpress app uh i'm using uh, publish i'm publishing port as 80 which is basically the cluster port uh, corresponding to the container port and at last i can specify the uh, the uh, the particular service name now i have two services which is running wordpress app and wordpress db in either way i can inspect uh, uh, the wordpress app and i will get a different vip altogether so in this case the uh, virtual ip address is 10005 which you can see in the screen i can go ahead and check the number of uh, the sites uh, number of services which is running across the cluster now it's time to do a kind of a service discovery so let me log in into one of the container which runs the wordpress uh, app or db and then try to ping uh, uh, the other services in the cluster so docker ps shows uh, what are the containers which is running uh, in the in the in the master node and if i am going to enter into one of uh, the wordpress app and if i try to ping wordpress db i i can able i am i am able to ping that machine so uh, so, so service discovery is through the unqualified name is what uh, the whole theme of this uh, uh, demo so not only ping i can i can uh, i can run a lot of other tools like ns lookup dig command the curl uh, to basically discover uh, the one service from another so if you see i have used a wget command and wget on a particular service and i should be able to get the page so the other important aspect which i want to cover here is a, uh, the scope of uh, service discoverability so if you see in the picture right so we have uh, what i have done is uh, kind of there are two services which is running in the last demo wordpress db and wordpress app and having a so having a, uh, a different individual vip address and uh, so in a master one i have a two uh, containers which is running here and this is the collabnet is basically a kind of a network and if you see whole this infrastructure is running on one network if i go, go ahead and and add a different network or a new network if i create a new network or collabnet one the services are not going to reach each other why because all the services are isolated so when you create a new service called wordpress db1 on collabnet1 it will get a new virtual ip address and when you try to reach out from this particular 
a container which is running on collabnet network to the wordpress db1 which is running on collabnet1 you won't be able to reach out to this if you have exposed the port just like an ingress networking you should be able to reach out to the other why because ingress is open throughout the throughout the cluster when you specify the port that opens throughout the cluster so that is only the case where you can reach out to the other services so this is my last slide where i am going to uh, talk about uh, the service discovery aspect uh, what is the key takeaways so service is now a first class citizen and plumb directly into the docker service uh, services can be published using the two modes which are the uh, you can use the both the modes if you want to use the dns rr you can just pass hyphen hyphen mode uh, endpoint mode dns rr and it should be able to use the dns rr uh, the third point is you can resolve a particular service by using its unqualified names i think docker team has really done a great job in this because the qualified name is not portable uh, the fourth point you don't need to expose a service specific port to make service available to other services uh, so it is not needed like you have to expose a port uh, for one uh, in the cluster to get an access to the other uh, and then the fifth point is uh, virtual ip is not going to change it is, it is going to be static so your backend is not going to change and that is an important consideration here your service discovery is always going to work uh, there has been a couple of uh, couple of queries and the uh, the bug uh, the pr raised regarding pinging the virtual ip address which is not doesn't work as of now uh, and it is expected uh, because technically ipvs is a tcp udp uh, load balancer while ping uses icmp and so this is not going to load balance the ping command and the other important consideration is for web based services uh, the ping generally works on the local node why because that is the second interface which has been added on the overlay network and the most important part is service discovery is scoped within a network so if you have a two services running on the same network it is going to ping each other whereas in the different network they are isolated so they, it is not going to work so uh, so i think i am done with this great thanks so much ajit uh next up we have victor so i'm just going to switch screens so Victor is a senior consultant at CloudBees. He's coded using a plethora of languages, and he can be found speaking about Docker all around the world. His big passions are microservices, continuous integration, delivery and deployment, and test-driven development. He wrote the DevOps 2.0 toolkit, automating the continuous deployment pipeline with containerized microservices, and the test-driven Java development books. His random thoughts and tutorials can be found on his blog, technologyconversations.com. I will, ah, sorry, I was muted. So, thank you, Jenny. Um, I will show you in a bit more details how networking works. So, um, and I'm going to go very fast because I have very little time and later on you can ask me questions if I was unclear about uh, things. So let's get going. I have here a um, small cluster with three nodes. One of them is a leader, manager, and the other two are uh, just simple workers. At the moment my situation is more or less like this. Three nodes with Docker uh, enabled swarm and nothing else. So let me create a network. So I'm going to create a Docker, uh, new network called Proxy. I'm going to create an, another network called Go Demo. You'll see soon uh, why do we want for those networks. Um, and if I list my networks, you can see that um, my Proxy network is there, Go Demo network is there, and Ingress, which comes by default and have a special purpose, is also there. I'm going to comment on that one as well very soon. So now my situation more or less in a cluster is like this. I have three nodes, two networks, still nothing inside of any of those net any of those networks. So if I create a service, I'm gonna start with the Mongo database. 
Uh, I'm naming it GoDemoDB. Uh, it belongs to GoDemo network only. Bit of me megabytes reserved and Mongo as as um, uh, image name. Uh, now, it, the important thing to understand is that I'm not opening any port on, on uh, for this service because this service is not meant to be accessible from outside uh, directly. So then, uh, let me create another service because those two services work together. The other one is uh, my own uh, API. Unlike the previous one, MongoDB, this one belongs to two networks, Go Demo and a proxy. A bit of reserved memory, and this is the name of the image Go Demo. So if I now take a look, for example, at um, at uh, process of my service Go Demo, I can see that it's already running for five seconds. If I see process, um, process of my database, it's already running for 40 seconds. So that's all working. And none of them has any ports exposed. So now my situation is more or less like this. I have three nodes. Somewhere inside of the cluster on one of the nodes is a database. The other one, the, uh, somewhere else is, a, uh, is my API, my backend, go demo. And the uh, database belongs to one of the networks, go demo is the end. And the other one belongs to both, to both proxy and go demo. That's my current situation. So now to demonstrate some of the um, features of the network, I'm going to create a, something called global service. You can see that this has, uh, has a more global. And uh, the feature of global service means that it will run on every single node per cluster. If you create a new node in the future, service will be there, uh, and so on and so forth. Simply, it's very good for infrastructure reasons if you want to um, have something running absolutely everywhere. So now we're going to go, go and install inside of one of those containers, Drill. Uh, which will show you show us the um, processes. Uh, sorry, the DNSs. So if I go inside of one of those two, con uh, one of the containers of my YouTube service, which belongs to both networks, if I ping Go Demo, I will get an answer. So basically, this service again also has no, no ports installed. You can always pick the other service because it belongs to the same network. So I got the answer yes, meaning that yes, excellent. You can communicate with the service called Go Demo, and this is the IP. Now, what is important to understand here is this is IP of a service, not of a particular instance of a service. And soon you will see why. And equally, if I if I drill into Go Demo DB, again, I get the answer, I get some different IP. We should not even care much about IPs because all we have to do, know only the name of the service and that that service belongs in the same network. So now, if I, for example, I'm going to just demonstrate a bit better. I'm going to scale my service to five, um, five instances. If I see process of my service, I see, I see that all five instances are currently running, right? Now my situation gets a bit more complicated. I have five instances of Go Demo service. Uh, it is connected to both networks, so it can speak to any other service that belongs to one of those two networks. Uh, go demo DB on with the go demo network, and still none of those services exposes any ports, so none of those services is accessible to outside. Still, in order to and I'm going to skip this. Uh, in order to demonstrate, uh, sorry, in order to demonstrate now what what should be done if we want our service to speak to outside world. Now you can of course you can expose a port. Um, Ah, sorry for that. Okay, so I'm gonna. So now, since none of my services have any ports exposed, I still need to make uh, make the first service in my cluster go demo uh, available to the outside public. What I usually do is run a proxy service. And that would be the only service in my cluster that ever, ever, ever exposes any port. In this case, exposes ports 18443. So I'm going to run a proxy. And in this case, it's only reverse proxy. This proxy will not do load balancing of any, any form or kind. So I'm going to run a proxy. It's going to belong to the network proxy. 
Um, and I'm going to run, since I'm a paranoid person, I'm going to run three replicas just in case if one of them fails. So that's about running. And if I see the process of my proxy, I can see that um, my proxy service is also somewhere inside of past. In this case, it's distributed uh, to one uh, to each one of the nodes of my cluster. And now my situation is more or less like this. I stopped drawing nodes. I have five instances of my GoDemo service. None of them exposes any port. GoDemo DB connected to those services, no ports exposed. And proxy service, which is the only service that actually exposes a port to the outside world. And consequently, is is also a member of the same network as GoDemo API. So now, if I reconfigure my proxy and ping my service, I get a response, right? I made ten pings, ten pings to my service. And please note now the important part is that I'm pinging my proxy running on, in this case, node one. Uh, I just as a coincidence, I happen to have one of the instances of the proxy on node one. But even if I didn't have any, any instance of my proxy on, on that node, it could still work. Uh, because And the, it, the reason why it would work is more or less because of the magic that the routing mesh provides. So what happened now when I ping my service, actually when I exposed my proxy to port 80, that port was not is not truly exposed. Uh, to the outside world. It just looks like it's, it's exposed. And the reason behind, behind, this, behind that is the routing mesh. So what happens when I ping my service, uh, when I send a request to my service to the, proc, uh, to the reverse proxy, which is going to redirect to my service, I'm actually exposing a port 80, in this case, to the routing mesh. And routing mesh has the same port open on every single node of the cluster. So no matter which node of the cluster the request uh, comes to, it will be it will enter into the routing mesh, and from routing mesh, uh, routing mesh will be it will perform load balancing across all the instances that have the same port open, and in this case, the service that has the same port at the open is is my proxy reverse proxy. So routing mesh receives the request on any of the nodes and sends to one of the instances of my service. Let's say that it sends to this one. And my service proxy, uh, which is in this case only reverse proxy, says, okay, so depending on your path of your request, looks like you want to go to the service called Go Demo. But unlike the previous cases, in, at least in BDO's form, proxy would not resend the request to one of the instances and do load balancing, but it will send the request back to proxy, proxy network. And proxy network that I created myself is going to do another round of load balancing and say and redirect that request to one of the instances of my Go demo service. In this case, it might go there or it might go anywhere. Simply, it will do round robin across all the instances. So that's more or less in a very brief kind of like 10 minutes explanation. And I think I have 15. I spoke too fast. Uh, how routing mesh works. It accepts requests on a, on a port that is open of one of the services, does load balancing, sends to the service, and then proxy picks it up, depending on the path of, of the request, sends to the network, which does another round of load balancing and sends to the final service. This makes it extremely easy these days to configure your proxies. If you use N N Nginx or HAProx or anything like that, you don't have to worry anymore about IPs. At least before, what I was doing is I would monitor, I would store my information about my services, about all instances of my services in Kozul. Whenever information in Kozul changes, I would reload my proxy uh, with a list of all IPs and then do load balancing and all those things. But now, since we have actually load balancing part of Docker network, we don't need anymore to, to, to do all those things to, to basically reconfigure every time an IP of an instance changes, we can just send to the to the endpoint, which is the name of the service, and the network will, will take care of load balancing and finding where the service is. So let's see now what happens if I update my service to release 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, 
Uh, let me copy this. So now I sent, okay, I want, um, I want to make a new release. I want to release 1.1. 1 .1. I want to de delay five seconds between each instances, and I want you to uh, perform rolling updates and avoid any downtime uh, to my service. So now if I check uh, my, uh, my processes, I see that four out of five instances already changed to release 1.1. And the fifth one changed as well. Now this is not so new. What is new is that now, thanks to the networking, I don't need to reconfigure my proxy anymore. Simply because the service, no matter which release I'm running on, and no matter where they are running, continues to maintain the same uh, endpoint within the network, which is equivalent to the name of the service. So if I uh, send a request to my service. I continue getting response to 100, hello world, everything works because uh, everything is moved, moved away from global basket, is moved away from the proxy and uh, into the Docker network. So that was my, I was afraid that I won't make it, that I will not have enough time. It turned out that I, I was actually faster than, than I was, than I had to be. So I give my five minutes extra to the next speaker. Thanks, Victor. Uh, great, so next up is Brett. I'm gonna pass him over the, the screen share. So Brett, for 20 years, he has designed, built, and operated distributed systems from four to 4,000. He currently focuses on DevOps style activities in the public cloud and enterprise. Brett works on creating immutable infrastructures, automation, containers, CI, CD, cloud monitoring, and an occasional JavaScript developer. He spends his free time in Virginia's local thriving tech scene, helping lead local Code for America and Docker meetup groups. He basically spends his days helping people. He lives at the beach and prefers dogs over cats. Hello. Um, thanks for being on the uh, meetup today. I'm a regular attender, so it's kind of fun to actually uh, get to talk to everyone. So I'm gonna talk about the command line and we're in the command line all day long with Docker usually, uh, unless you have UCP or some other fancy doings in front of it. And so there's a lot of things that can save us time. Uh, and uh, it's funny how I'll be talking to someone and if, we're, if we both watch each other work in Docker, we typically learn something about how to use the command line faster from each other, um, particularly when you've been using it a while. So uh, there's lots of stuff to learn. But we're going to skim through some of the highlights. And if you, um, all in that talk away from here, all the links to the documentation on um, what, what I'm going to be doing here, uh, you can get it from fisher.com. Uh, and I'm also going to post it um, now to the Docker Online Meetup chat uh, on the meetup.com website. So that way, anyone who comes in later can see that stuff. So the first thing we're going to talk about is. Um, if you're on Linux or Mac, you're probably using Bash or maybe something like ZSH as your shell. If you're on Windows, it's actually pretty common now to get Bash. In fact, in Windows 10, we can actually get Bash natively uh, with some Ubuntu add-ons. So the nice thing is, is that there's, there's something called Bash and ZSH completion. You probably, uh, if you've used it, these shells for a while, you probably know of this well. Um, a lot of times, it's simply just not knowing if a file exists or but by hitting tab, I can find something like uh, where's my Docker file, and it just sort of auto completes. And different shells do that a little bit differently. But in Docker, we actually have pre built in uh, bash completion that comes from Docker. There's lots of other options if you actually just search uh, Google, you'll find other libraries that do different things. But uh, Docker Inc. actually provides with, um, with a couple of commands if you're on. on uh, Mac, you'll probably use Brew, Homebrew, to actually install it. But it'll do some pretty nice things. So, uh, for instance, if I don't know the command, I can just hit Tab, and it'll give me a list of commands. And let's say I need to do Docker images. So I have a lot of images here. And what if I need to remove an image, but I don't remember the exact name of it. I think it was Alpine. So I can hit tab, it'll auto-populate. It'll, if I have multiple ones, it'll list them. Um, 
what if I need to do it by ID, but I don't remember the whole number? Um, actually, that doesn't work in RMI. Let's see, Docker, PS. Okay, well, ignore that for a second. We're going to come back to the IDs anyway. Uh, <laughs> we So you can also do help. So if I'm doing Docker image, or maybe I'm doing Docker build, and I don't know all of the different options I have, it seems that my, I might have broken some of my niceties. Docker, there we go. Um, and so what I'm getting here is I'm getting context since it aware completion where it's going to show me all of the options that I can fill out for each one of the commands. So there's lots of, there's a growing set of commands in Docker and um, I don't remember them all. I don't know if anyone knows every single one of the options for all of the commands. So it's nice to have this completion in there and you, you can look at the notes to actually figure out how to install that if you don't already have it. It might actually be there and you just didn't know it. Um, the next thing actually isn't a bash completion. It's actually a built-in feature of Docker is that you don't actually have to type in the full hashes or IDs for images and containers. You just have to type enough when you're referencing them to be unique. So a common thing I would want to do is um, Docker images, again, I have a lot of them, and I want to get rid of, let's say, this, um, this one called fake lookup or something. So actually, I'll do this blank one up here. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So that one right there. So I don't, uh, I don't have to type the whole thing if I'm looking at my screen. I can just type in 1.8. Hopefully, that's unique. And it'll delete that, that image. And if we go back, 1.8 is no longer there. Uh, you can do the same thing with container names. So um, if I'm doing a Docker PS, You can just do like a 7.6 there, and it will automatically find the closest match and give it to me, or the exact match. Um, if there's a case where you actually have duplicate matches, yeah, it looks like it doesn't take one character. I was wondering if I had actually images that um, matched the first two characters. Anyway, uh, I believe it gives you a warning if it doesn't have a unique match, but I don't ever really get those, so I don't really have that have too much of an issue. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about a little bit. It's not necessarily uh, the command line completion stuff, but the sort of tidying of your workspace. So if you're a developer or if you're someone who's managing uh, local containers. This obviously works on servers as well, but a lot of times you'll end up with lots of volumes and images and and uh, can grow quite, quite unwieldy, especially in a development environment where you're constantly starting new environments and having to kill them and lots of different projects and people are throwing you random things. So for instance, um, you know, my machine, oops, I probably have yeah, lots of volumes there. And of course, they're all but one named with a GUID. So uh, one tip here is that uh, every time you can, just give a name to your volumes. And uh, by, the, by the way you do that is a lot of times, like if you do a Postgres server, there's a volume command in a Docker file, but you need to name it so that you get this friendly little psql if you see that down at the bottom. So this is my way of knowing that my local Postgres server this is, the vo this is an easy way of identifying the volume. I can do it other ways through a Docker inspect and then get the, uh, the volume name out of it. But um, this is actually, I think, a more convenient way, especially when I'm doing something common, like if I'm looking at Docker PS here, um, I have my Postgres server running, but if I need to run another one, I'm gonna cut and paste. So here might be a typical docker run command, and I'm actually going to call it psql2. So this right here at the volume command, if I don't put a forward slash, a beginning slash, 
then Docker automatically considers this a named volume. This, this, won't, this won't be any different than a regular anonymous volume other than it just won't use a GUID. Right? It'll, it'll use the same settings, but it's going to actually give it a friendly name. It helps me identify it easier, especially when I'm dealing with the de development environments. So if I run that, uh, and of course I can't do that because that port's already used. Okay, I'm being silly. Okay, so now if I do a Docker volume again, you'll see that I have these labeled volumes and that helps me know which ones, if I need to mount them later uh, to something else and remember what I call them. And a lot of times I will just name them the same as I name a container and so they match when I'm dealing with local development, especially database servers, stuff like that. So um, another tip for the command line, especially when you're dealing uh, with quick development stuff that you need to uh, throw in, maybe you don't have a, a Docker file ready and you need to uh, spin up an environment and get into it to change some files. Typically this might be for like a Ruby or a Node environment where you're de you do local development, but you don't want to spin up, uh, you want to actually spin it up inside a container so it's running inside a container. Um, that is to use the on build command. And it's actually a, a really nice feature that's not commonly known. And I'm going to show you an example here. Um, so uh, just for example, this a lot of repositories have this. So if you're using official repositories and you are, uh, you can probably just do a, a repository search with the on build command. And what you'll notice, this is, uh, I have here Ruby as well as Node, and the same things. You'll notice that there's this little on build option. So the on build option is actually a, a statement in a Docker file that says any new Docker files that are using this as their from line, run these on build commands in them. So it's actually a down level uh, command that will work on, so if I was to create my own Docker file and say from node dash on build, just like it specifies here. Um, if I just use the on build command or if I can specify different versions, what will happen is I don't have to repeat the common practices of node. So every uh, coding environment, uh, coding uh, like Ruby or Java or node, or PHP, they all have very, um, nowadays they have very consistent um, expectations and conventions around how you're going to develop in that environment. So in Node, you usually have a package JSON file. You usually do an NPM install before you start your app and you usually copy in the source code. So these are all sort of standard practices and best practices around Node. So if you conform to those, you don't actually have to create your own manual Docker file with all this stuff in it. You just need a one line Docker file that specifies on the on build version. And they actually talk about it down here where they say, uh, if you use the on, um, see, the on build version, they talk to you about how that works. It's not recommended for production just because you may not be able to, uh, you, want to be, you may want to be more literal about exactly what you're doing in production. So, um, because the on build command might change slightly over time as, as to what it's doing in there. But for local development, it's very quick and very easy to use that. And um, it will save you time. So the next little tip here is kind of related to the on build because I love using Docker Compose. And so I'm usually creating Docker Compose, even when I have single web apps or anything that I'm using locally, I will usually use Docker Compose just for that. I mean, it was designed to be a developer tool to make it so easy locally to set stuff up. So what I have here is a Docker Compose file, very simple, for, for two services. It's just a Mongo server and a website that I'm developing. And uh, the, the thing that everybody knows how to use Docker Compose usually when I talk to them. But what they don't realize is the docker compose down command and the significance of that. So if I do docker compose up, this will create my VMs, or I'm sorry, not my VMs, my containers, and uh, we'll start them up. And I'm, I didn't do the dash D, so I'm getting this right in the console. So normally right now, this is where I could go and I could just develop on my Mac and it would automatically update inside the container and I could look at the website and all that. And then when I was done, I would just hit control C and I'd go about my day. But if this is not something I'm not, not going to come back to right away. If I do the docker compose down command, the down actually cleans stuff up. 
because there's stuff that reside, stays around. Obviously, we have the containers. So if I do a Docker ps a, you can see that these two containers were exited. Um, I could also do Docker compose ps, obviously, and it shows that they've exited. But um, so sometimes people will just go in and manually delete those containers. But that actually doesn't clean up everything. You actually, if you saw, we saw up at the top here that a, a uh, Docker network was created. And it's named the, the name of the app, or usually the directory. And uh, so this isn't going to get cleaned up, right? But if I do the docker compose down command, then it will clean up my containers, delete those, and it will do the network. Now, what it's not going to do is it's not going to delete the volume, uh, any volumes that I might have been using. So I don't have to worry about losing data. And it also won't delete the images. I can, however, specify um, with other options. I didn't seem to want to do completion there. Um, I can actually do completion or uh, a dash V, which will actually force the volumes to be removed. And then I can do an RMI. And I, that'll actually say delete all uh, images that I actually created manually locally. So it won't, mix, it won't actually delete the Mongo one, but it'll delete the web server one that I had. So. Uh, that's a little t handy tip, and it helps keep your environment clean because eventually you're going to have a hundred different networks, one for every Docker container you created that you didn't do the Docker compose, compose down on. So there's that. All right, let's uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some aliases. Um, aliases are Bash or ZS ZSH or any of your shells, Fish if you like Fish. Um, Aliases are things you can throw in your startup that will make it faster for you. To, and if, if you've been using these very very long, you've definitely run into aliases. You just may not remember that you can still create them on the fly and you can actually use them um, uh, to save you time. So there's some a lot of them out there. You can just do Docker. You can just do a search on Docker alias uh, list or whatever on Google. You'll find lots of lists. They're, there's huge lists. The problem is I can't remember them all. So I thought I'd just give you four that I use regularly. And the first one, this one right here, uh, the, I call it DRMA, but you can call it whatever you want, obviously. I do it for Docker Remove All. And what this does is this will clean up all of my containers, um, remove them all uh, if they're stopped. It won't, it won't delete running containers. It won't delete images. It just deletes containers that are stopped because a lot of times I'll end up with a lot of containers that I use once and I forgot to clean them up later, and this is a single line command I can use to get rid of that, so I can just use DRMA to do that. Um, the next one is similar, but it's for images, uh, and there's a feature in uh, Docker, if you've ever run into it, known as uh, filters, and filters allow me to search on attributes when I'm listing something. So I can search on, there's a feature in images called dangling, and a dangling image is one that's been created locally that has no name, it hasn't been tagged. And so you'll see that in mine. I have a lot of them, right? So if I just did, uh, if I did a DRMI, it's gonna delete all of those. All right, so now I'm nice and clean. I got rid of all those dangling images. Uh, there's a, a more uh, nuclear option that I actually have that's called, uh, um, DRMI, actually, well, I call it DRMAI, that is very similar to that. They will actually delete all images uh, that don't have a running container. So this one's a little bit more hardcore. It will actually delete things that just aren't being used right now. And most of the, most of the time, if you have them tagged, that's usually because you have them stored somewhere else and it's not important that you need them locally. But I sometimes will use that um, when I'm running out of space on my hard drive. All right, two more. And one of them is if you're still using Docker Machine, and uh, which is still a great tool if you're running multiple virtual machines. If you're not on Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows and you're using Docker Machine, uh, it's, it's sometimes tedious to change your environments. So a lot of times I will take each environment and I will make a very short alias out of it. So that, for example, this one will actually change uh, my Docker Machine to the default environment with, just by me typing dr default. Then, then I don't have to type out the full eval command, and I'm sure if you're using Docker Machine, you're used to the eval command, and uh, that can uh, that can be a little tedious. 
So I make little shortcuts for the ones that I'm switching back and forth from all the time. And then lastly, this is not a, a huge time saver, uh, but it can be extended, uh, is I'm always jumping into containers with a Docker exec. And so if you're, if you're trying to debug something in a container, you need to jump in uh, from a separate uh, container that temporarily opens up uh, an executable uh, inside the existing running container. The Docker exec command was made for that. And so I can do something like that. So I can do Docker PS. I can see that I have Postgres running, so I can do a drit uh, p sql bash, for example, and I'm in my container. So it's a little bit shorter, so it'll save me a few strokes. There's actually shortcuts out there you can find that will actually automatically use the, well, they will throw in the bash for you if you actually create a function instead of an alias. And so it'll be a little fancy, so then I could shorten that command to actually be just drit p sql, um, but I don't, I don't actually have that one. And I believe that's it for aliases. Like I said, there's lots of lists out there. Um, the last two things I would just mention are filters and formatting. So if you're not familiar with filters, I mentioned it a little bit ago, but there are a lot of ways, especially when you're dealing with swarms and large environments, there are lots of ways to filter your commands. And you don't have to worry, you don't have to always use grep um, or awk to, to find things. You can actually use existing filters. So in my notes, there's some links to example filters you can use. You can use those locally. Uh, we actually used one a while ago when we used the uh, dangling command, the dangling filter for our images. And then um, we have filters here. And then we also have formatting. And so formatting allows you to actually completely customize the way the output of the Docker command works. So if I, for example, did this, then I'm not actually wanting the back ticks. So what this does is this would actually format my Docker images command to the exact columns I want. Maybe I need to throw out, throw out a report to the to management because they want to see all of our images in production or something. So uh, this allows me some flexibility and that prevents me from having to do greps or any sort of fancy uh, command line foo. I can throw these in there really quickly. So, um, so I want to thank you for uh, listening. I hope you learned a trick or two about the command line. And if you have any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter or at my email address on the screen there. And I am done. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eugene, Victor, and, and Brett. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us. And for everyone that's on, thanks for joining us today. And um, I'll be posting all the slide decks and a recording of the video and all the, the contact information um, on the Meetup page, and we'll also be posting it as a blog, so stay tuned for that. Um, and everyone, have a great rest of your day. Thanks.